Hello walkers, and we're in Cork. But stay with us, stay with us all to the end. We're gonna learn a few things here. We're gonna learn about the four-faced liar. We're gonna learn what was the famous ship who made its final port of call here. And of course, we'll find out exactly how many pubs there are in Cork. Now, we won't visit all of them. I haven't got enough time for that. I'll give you a guess, it's more than 50. It's more than 100. Stay tuned, let's find out. And so we make a start. To the sound of the bells. Shandon Bells and Tower. It's St Anne's Church. Look at the clock faces. So one says quarter past, well, five past three. The other says seven minutes to six. If you were to go around and look at the other two, you'd notice they all tell a different time. Now this is why the tower gets its name, the four-faced liar. Because how are you supposed to tell the time if all the clocks are telling you different? Up on the top, you might see the weather vane. So you probably can't tell from here, but it's a large, four metre long salmon. Now, that's here to represent the fishing industries around here. And it's gold plated. It's a gold plated fish, four metres long. What might you think its local nickname is? No, it's not Bruce, it's not Fishy McFish Face. It is Goldie Fish. Here's the front of the building. Looking up again, time at the front is seven minutes past three. Not hearing any bells at the minute. Well, this place is famous because you can go in there and for five euros, you can ring the bells yourself. They provide a little guide. So some very easy tunes to play. They've named all the bells for you. They number them. What's quite interesting is if you go onto TripAdvisor and look at reviews for this, because all the top reviews seem to be from all the local neighbors who are imploring everybody to please stick to the tunes because it's really no fun if you live next door and you're just pulling all six bells at the same time. Gets a bit wearing after a while. What's this up ahead? So this is the Firkin Crane building. So this is now it's a dance and cultural center. But that's not what it used to be. So it used to be here that they made and repaired all the barrels uh, for butter. Now, another name for a barrel is a firkin, hence the name firkin crane. What's the importance of butter? Well, butter was extremely important in this region. Brought a lot of wealth and prosperity. In fact, in front of us, you've got the Butter Museum, which used to be the Butter Exchange. Butter is still important to the area. So if you follow like, the keto diet, Tim Ferriss has told you to use only grass-fed butter, like Kerrygold for frying, or in your bulletproof coffee, Kerrygold comes from this area. Hugely important. All over here, Four Liars Bistro. Again, there's that name again. And it does feel, at least to me, a little Parisian in this area. I've noticed that quite a lot around town. Uh, not just because the the shape of the centre of Cork, as it is splitting the River Lee, 
So it's got the river to its north and south. Again, a little bit like uh, Paris. We're going to head down towards the centre of town. A little bit about Cork itself though. What does the name mean? So Cork comes from the Gaelic Corca, which means marsh. So it used to be just marshland around here. In fact, there were just lots of little islands, lots of marsh. And that was quite handy. So if you think of a couple hundred years ago, if you were producing butter, didn't have a fridge, maybe you didn't have a lot of salt, how would you keep your butter fresh? Well, the way they did it was to seal it in casks, stick it in the peat bog. If you know anything about peat bogs, keep all the oxygen out. Hence, your butter would stay fresh. In fact, I think in the museum, they claim to have a, a cask of butter that's presumed to be a thousand years old. I'm not sure about that. Maybe I haven't got that right. Oh, but just look, let's just pause here for a moment. See the skyline of Cork in its glory. So we're just gonna head down. Again, we've got the north part of the River Lee. Down just at the bottom of the stairs. And we're going to take up the rest of this walk on the other side, down by the south. And we're going to walk up Grand Parade. Now we're just on St Paul's Avenue here, just across from St Mary's. I just want to show you this mural here. The Royal Kingfisher. So this celebrates the largest kingfisher ever found on the river. This is 1793, I believe. And what's impressive about this mural is it's uh, life-size. So you can imagine how scary it must have been for the locals to see this coming out of the water. Uh, luckily, this particular breed seems to have uh, died out. So they seem to be a lot smaller now, just the size of sort of uh, taxis now, which is less stressful. Anyway, let's move on. So we're starting here on just one of 29 bridges across the River Lee here, 29 bridges. That's five more than in Dublin, which if my maths is correct, is 24 bridges. There's a little rumor going around here. The last six bridges here were all put up in one night and they're all inflatable. I don't believe that. Here we are on Grand Parade, and isn't it grand? Let's take a little wander down this way. So we've got the River Lee just behind us, but we'll also have the River Lee uh, up ahead of us, probably about half a mile away. So it's a little bit like Paris in some ways here. Just as you, in Paris, you've got the Seine, and you've got like, two big islands in the middle. Got Isle de, de la Cité and Ile Saint Louis. Here, you've got the heart of Cork. Just as we're looking along here, there are these three good coffee shops within 100 yards. Three falls here. Very nice, although it's outdoor sitting only. I can recommend it. Just behind it, across the way, you've got Bean and Leaf. That has some indoor space, and that is really good coffee. And around the corner, we have Soma.
which I'll point to in a moment. Well, these things here, by the way, you'll see them dotted around the city. Uh, they're using like moss mats to filter the ambient air through, improve the air quality. Can't vouch that they work. I haven't stuck my face up to one and sniffed. And there is uh, Suma just down the road there. And if you follow that road down, so just peeking at the bottom, you can see a glass building. If I was to take you down there, which I'm not going to today, but you'll see got a very weird a Tudor facade on the front of the building. Looks quite odd. It's part of the old Beamish uh, distillery. It's the counting house. And it's got a massive glass construction on the back. So it's going to become a new events venue. Let's pop in here. Bishop Lucy Park. We've got the remnants of the old city wall here. Just a few hundred years ago, this was a tributary of the River Lee down here, there's a water canal down here, because it's all been filled in now. Up in front of us, we've got a mural, and it's got a figure cutting up some fruit, some vegetables, some fish, some wine. So it all really points to the English market, which is something we'll go and have a look at in a moment. In fact, it's just across away from us, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So the sun is shining. I said that this used to be a, a waterway along here. In fact, if you came here yesterday, you would have felt like you were back there in the 1700s. So it's absolutely sodden down here. And that's the weird thing about the weather the last couple of days. We've had glorious sunshine and in five minutes we've had hailstones. So what's the history of Cork? So it started off as a monastic settlement. Founded by St. Finbar. And then around 915, uh, the Vikings moved in. I guess at first they can be seen as uh, raiders, but there appears to have been a somewhat symbiotic relationship between themselves and the monastic order over the years. The Vikings moved here because of course this was lots of marshland, lots of little islands, perfect for the Vikings to start trading, trading in land, also raiding in land, depending how they felt that day. Taking a little detour at the minute. I'll take you along Corn Market Street. Just want to show you something. So I mentioned the English market earlier. We'll talk about that when we get there. But at the time, that was really only for the use of the Protestants, who were referred to as the English. 
And so where do the Irish get to do their shopping? Well, down here, what is now a restored bar is St. Peter's. And this would have been where everyone else would come down their shopping. There we are, St. Peter's Market up on the left. Let's have a little spin around here. I know you want to have a look at TK Maxx and Lidl, so we'll pass them. Rising Suns Brewery on the left. Not been in there. As you walk around, it's not so noticeable here, or maybe at the end of the road it is, you will notice that all the signs are in two languages, Gaelic and English. Now here's something you probably didn't know. So I'm half Irish, absolutely. If you want to know which half, if you just um, picture probably where your kidneys are and just below that all the way down that's uh, the Irish half the rest of it's uh, English well actually is it I reckon if I did one of those ancestry.com DNA tests like most people I'd find a bit of a mixture in there maybe a bit of Scandinavian maybe a bit of Russian who knows a bit of a mongrel to be honest like most people. Now, like anyone else who uh, is half Irish, naturally, I can speak Gaelic fluently and I can read it perfectly well. English, I'm not very good at. I do my best, to be honest. Let's have a little nip across here. head down to the English market. As we go through the English market, I probably won't talk much through that. But we'll also have another video up. We'll cover the English market, just a little bit more detail. Green post boxes. So it's a very still, quiet day today. So I hope you appreciate all the wind noise I've added. A little bit of building work now and again, just to build up the ambience. Well, it's fine that, you know, the sound environment quality of these walks is really important. If it's too quiet, well, it's just not the same, is it really? Okay, here we go. So in the English market, so you probably won't talk as we go through it. Let's have a little wonder.
Пойдем. А здесь это интереснее начинать. А здесь и The English market goes back to, oh, off the top of my head, I'd say about 1788. You can check up that number. As I said before, only the Protestants were allowed to hold stalls in there, or the English. And so therefore, it's the Irish population held their stalls in St. Peter's. Now, not much of the original building remains. It's been rebuilt and restored over so many years. A few fires, 1981, there's a big fire. Uh, it got restored again there. And now, so really, it's a great place just to pop in, find local produce, sit and have a little coffee. So we're turning on to Oliver Plunkett Street. This thriving street, it's sort of, uh, it goes well. Basically, you think of the center of Cork as a little island, and it cuts straight across the middle from south to north. Lots of independent shopping. I'm just going to get a feel for what's here. We're going to walk up and down a couple of the lanes. Let's pick. Marlborough Street. Let's head on up. So if you come into a Cork, it is great just to basically hang out in the city really walk around it's always the best way to get the feel of a place just soak up the atmosphere if you want a few more things to do we've got the crawford art gallery which is up near the uh the north part got over three thousand artworks there uh, there's got a lot of greek and roman sort of castings there if you're thinking of going there is free which is great but you might want to check that it's open I know at the minute they're talking about some renovation and they might might end up closing the place for up to two years so do check on let's see if we can get across look at that by the power of grey skull got some more of these air purifiers here and this is a nice little spot too. You often get a, a band come to play here. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to head up Carey's Lane. And it's a good area, particularly if you want to find a little restaurant. It's quite a bubbly little atmosphere. It's like Friday, Saturday nights. Let's head down here. So a couple of other things you might want to look at. Well, actually, before I do, Cafe Fellini. Supposedly the oldest cafe in Cork. Had a coffee in there the other day. You might get the impression, by the way, that most of our traveling involves stopping for coffee. That's because we like coffee. Don't know if we mentioned that. I'll just mention it again. We do like coffee. Mexican restaurant on the right. Delivery driver on the left. I notice they've all got uh, electric bikes these days, it might make it a bit easier on the knees. Look, more coffee places. One thing I have noticed is the high streets here seem to be doing, well here anyway, seem to be doing a little bit better than I've noticed back in the UK. Maybe there's not so many chain shops, I don't know. We'll be talking about shopping later. This is Rory Gallagher Place. So you've got the little Paul Street shopping centre here. <coughs> well, we're heading this way. A couple of other things you might want to do if you're looking for something to do here. Uh, you've got Nanonago Place, which have restored uh, walled convent. And you can head there, it tells a tale of sort of 18th century Cork. Let's head down here. We've got Cork Jail, which is a castle like building. It's not a jail anymore. And we've got waxworks, they've got one of those little audio guides you can go around and uh, maybe get a feel of what it would be like if you were stuck there in the 1800s. Probably not entirely pleasant. So we're passing a few bars. We'll see a few pubs on our way. I did say, I'll tell you how many pubs there are here. So, what would you think? It's quite a small city centre. 50, 60. I think according to a census in 2018, that was a thousand. I'm guessing that's not just the city centre, but a thousand. That's, that's quite a lot. It's only from the times I've been to Ireland in the past before, a little bit younger. And it's not unusual to have a pub at most sort of in sections, at the end of each street. I and mean, obviously I think that's changed now, but, um, oh, look at that sunshine.
machine. Let us. I'm just going to pop down here. I'm being very bad and jaywalking. If you're into books, there's a good few bookshops here. There's usual Waterstones. There's a couple of other independent ones here too. So obviously it's a university town. I don't know if you know that. Find the university off to sort of the west of the city, just along the river. So the city of Cork may also be a familiar name to you too. 1912, it's the last port of call of the Titanic. It's too big to actually sit in the harbour. But it's set out in the water. Had lots of tenders going out, bringing passengers out there, topping up supplies. And we all know what happened to the Tide Hainic, don't we? There was also a steamship that attempted the, it was like the first Atlantic crossing. That was sort of the 1800s, 1838, I'm guessing. And it left here, again, to attempt the crossing to the United States. But it uh, sank off Ballycotton. It hit a, hit a rock. It was no more. Now, I'm not saying it's cursed. But if you lose two big ships, It's always lovely to see, isn't it, all the coloured buildings. And the guy calling over there, he's selling newspapers. Not sure what paper it is. Winthrop Street. Let's come down here. So, let's already show you the main high street and just have a look at some of the, the buildings down here to finish off. So up ahead, you see the Savoy building. So that used to be a big cinema. Uh, dates back to, oh, let me guess, 1932. That sounds just about right. Hasn't been a cinema for quite some time. He's got planning permission for three retail units, apparently. So we'll see what that is. It would be a shame not to see that building used. Dunn stores over there, very famous. I mean, that goes back to 1944. I suppose the end of the Second World War, really. It's like a local Irish family. It's a drapery business originally. 
and it was immensely popular when it opened because their motto was better value. Basically at the end of the war they were offering people prices that were pre-war prices. You can imagine after the war prices had shot up, inflated enormously. So there was a bit of a stampede. Very popular. And then so we've got Brown Thomas, lovely big old building here, still open. But what I want to show you, what I'll finish off with, is a shop called Pennies. Hi. Now, Hi. if you don't live in Ireland, you're probably unfamiliar with the name, but I bet you have shopped in one of their stores. The name might not be familiar, but it's known in most other countries as Primark. Oh yes. Absolutely, so Primark started here. We're actually, it started in Dublin. That was the first one in 1969. Uh, Arthur Ryan started the first one there. It spread across islands, became popular. And for some reason, as it spread across the world, it took on the name Primark. Well, this is where it all began. Well, actually, Dublin, but imagine we're two hours away from there. Primark. And so, we'll finish off with just a little sweeping view. If we head up that way, that takes us up to the north part of the river. River Lee. There you find Bridge Street, you'll find the Art Gallery, it's an opera house. But for now, I'm going to leave you. I hope you've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed it, and that's the most important thing. And if you haven't already, do subscribe because it's good for you and it's good for us. And we look forward to seeing you on another one. Okay, take care. See you soon.